everyone um, from India and Sri Lanka and Pakistan all over to the Pacific. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, my name is Matthew Baird. I am the uh, director of the Asian Research Institute for Environmental Law um, and I'd like to welcome you to this uh, exciting and very, very topical uh, webinar um, on the advisory opinion on the International Court of Justice. Now, the next two months are very significant for the environment and environmental law. Uh, at the moment, the Biodiversity COP, COP16, is taking place now in Cali and Colombia. Um, and in November, the final no negotiations, or we think the final negotiations, the INC5, for the Plastics Treaty will take place in Busan in Korea. And then that's going to be followed by COP29 on the Climate COP, which will take place in Baku, Azerbaijan. Um, but also, very importantly, the oral arguments are due to be heard in December 2024 um, on the resolution from the United Nations for an advisory uh, opinion in respect of the obligations of states in respect to climate change. So on the 29th of March 2023, the UN General Assembly uh, voted to request an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on the obligations of states in respect to climate change. And there were two parts to that, and we'll, we'll come to that during this uh, webinar. Um, the exciting thing about this, uh, this decision by the United Nations General Assembly is that it was followed the campaign started by a group of law students in Vanuatu and then joined by youth climate activists worldwide. Uh, and it became just really a worldwide phenomenon. Um, it was one of the most extraordinary things that I think ha that happened uh, in 2022 and 2023, um, and I still get very excited talking about it. Um, and uh, Ariel has been working with World Youth for Climate Justice um, and the groups involved and supported them and been inspired by them to look at this whole idea of how this we came to this point that the International uh, Court of Justice is going to consider the idea of what are the legal obligations of states in respect to climate change. Uh, and importantly, there's also going to be a discussion about the liability of states uh, if they fail to take that into account. Um, and this is really important because liability for loss and damage, um, the issue of the obligation of states, the idea of who is responsible um, and how we should pay uh, for the significant uh, issues about adaptation and mitigation are all things that are going to be discussed by the International Court of Justice. Uh, and one of the things we are very excited at the moment is we've got three speakers who can talk about um, different elements uh, today. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Tithmini Bandara, who's a final year law undergraduate at the Faculty of Law of uh, University of Colombo in Sri Lanka. And she's going to talk about the World Youth for Climate Justice campaign um, and the role of the youth. And after that, we've got Alvin Yap from the University of Western Australia, who's going to be talking about some of the procedural and strategic considerations in the advisory opinions. And we're followed by Priya Katika from the Indonesian Centre for Environmental Law, who's going to talk about climate justice. So we're going to have those three speakers and they're going to give presentations. At the end, we will then have questions and answers. Um, and in relation to the, um, uh, the discussion that we have, uh, we do have the Q&A uh, session and the, and the chat box where you can put in questions and answers uh, for people. And we're going to have lots of time uh, for questions and answers at the end of, of the presentations. Um, what I'd like to do now uh, is introduce uh, formally our three speakers. Uh, Chitmini Bandara is a final year law undergraduate at the Faculty of Law at the University of Colombo in Sri Lanka. She currently serves as the secretary of the pro bono department of the Law Students Association of Sri Lanka and is a junior researcher at the Center for Environmental Law and Policy, affiliated with the Faculty of Law at the University of Colombo. 
Additionally, she is a coordinator at the World Youth Climate Justice Sri Lankan Front. Known for her dedication and efficiency, Chismithni is passionate about volunteering and has a keen interest in environmental law and climate justice. She's committed to making a positive impact through her work and advocacy. After her, Alvin Yap is a lecturer at the University of Western Australia and a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney. He is also an independent consultant in public international law with a decade of experience acting as counsel for states and international organisations in proceedings before various international courts and tribunals, including the ICJ, uh, ITLOS, the, uh, the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, Iran-US Claims Tribunal, and UNCLOS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and X7 tribunals. Previous instructions, including acting for Timor-Leste in the Timor Sea Treaty Arbitration, Colombia in two ICGA cases against Nicaragua, Bolivia in the Celalu case before the ICJ, India in the Enrica Lexia arbitration, and he currently acts as counsel for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature in the Climate Change Advisory Proceedings before the ICJ. And our final speech uh, presenter, Prili Katika, is a researcher for the Indonesian Center for Environmental Law. She holds a bachelor's degree from the Faculty of Law at the University of Indonesia, she is currently working as a researcher at the Indonesian Centre for Environmental Law under the Environmental Governance and Climate Justice Division. In ICEL, her work revolves around the strengthening law enforcers' capacity in environmental law enforcement, such as for environmental investigators and judges. In addition, she's also involved in developing and strengthening environmental legislation and instruments, and she has been involved in capacity building for civil society, such as conducting trainings on environmental impact assessment. Really has also worked to strengthen enabling conditions for the fulfillment of environmental rights, such as in the issue of gender equity, disability, and social inclusion. Apart from that, she's one of the representatives of ICEL on the ASEAN Environmental Working Group, and we've been working with her for the last uh, two years on developing the Declaration on the Rights um, of Environmental Rights in ASEAN. So it's a great pleasure uh, to welcoming you all here today. Uh, without any further ado, Tithmini, I would like to give you the floor and I'll start sharing my screen for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathim, and thank you so much for that warm introduction. And uh, first of all, I would like to um, introduce myself. So I'm Shitmini Bandara, and uh, I am currently a campaigner at the World's Youth for Climate Justice. And it's an honor to address a group of um, individuals who are coming from a varied, various backgrounds, but united by uh, their interest in climate change. So today I will be uh, addressing, uh, today I will be discussing WICJ or World's Youth for Climate Justice and the role of youth in the ICJ advisory opinion on climate. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's move ahead with the presentation. Patil, could you please change the slide? Uh, first of all, I would like to give you a little roadmap to the presentation that will make it easier for you to understand what to expect within the next uh, 13 to 14 minutes. So first, I will be shedding some lights on who we are, what our organization is, giving a brief introduction to our organization, and then I will be um, discussing what are our objectives, our visions and missions as a youth-led organization. And then as the third point, we have why youth voices matter in the fight for climate justice and uh, also our work as WICJ and WICJ Asian Front. So as you may already know, we have different fronts established in different regions uh, of the world. So WICJ Asian Front is one of the prominent fronts of all, them all. And also I will be sharing some of my personal reflections and how my journey with WICJ has been so far. And then I will be sharing some insights as to what we are looking forward to as a um, youth-led organization promoting for climate justice. And finally, I would like to conclude my presentation emphasizing on the urgency of youth-led climate justice. Uh, Matthew, could you please change the slide? Thank you. Who we are. 
we are world's youth for climate justice and as you can see on the screen in simple terms we are a group of stubborn optimists we or as you may already know we are critical juncture of our history climate change is one of the biggest issues in our generation so this climate change or in other words this climate crisis has come up to a point where that defines our era so it is really important to take necessary steps in um addressing climate change and also taking mitigatory measures to address the adverse effects of the climate change and historically youth led organizations and youth movements have been catalysts of the Uh, social political and economical transformations in different nations around the world they uh, from gender justice gender equality and from civil rights they have brought these pressing issues to the light and this climate issue this climate change issue requires similar response from youth a uh, youth individuals or young individuals so therefore world's youth for climate justice has been at the forefront of this battle against climate change promoting climate justice and also calling for an advisory opinion from international court of justice uh, concerning climate change and human rights next slide please our campaign mainly seeks to clarify the obligations of states to protect the rights of current and future generations from the adverse effects of climate change looking back um at our journey as a youth led organization um in collaboration with PISFCC um Pacific Island Students Fighting Climate Change we rallied the state of Vanuatu so if you know about the state of Vanuatu which is located in the South Pacific uh, region so we rallied the state of Vanuatu to make a historic request before the United Nations General Assembly in 2021 so as a response to that request the united nations general assembly unanimously adopted a resolution calling on the international court of justice which is the highest court to issue an advisory opinion on the state obligations relating to climate change uh, next slide please now i would like to share some of our previous and ongoing work as world youth for climate justice and uh, world youth for climate justice asian front so i i will be going ahead with wycj um so as you can see on the screen we presented two briefs to the inter american court of human rights in its advisory proceedings on the climate emergency and human rights if i may bring your attention to the first brief you can see it is on differentiated obligations of the states to protect children and youth in climate crisis and if i may bring your attention to the second brief it is on the intricate relationship between climate emergencies and human rights in the latin americas moving on next slide please and also as a youth organization we have done collaborations with various other international and regional organizations and institutions so this is uh, one example for that world youth for climate justice in collaboration with ciel client earth and pi sfcc we published key takeaways from iplos advisory opinion Uh, if you are someone who's been close uh, closely pursuing the international courts and their proceedings their advisory opinions and judgments you know the iplos uh, issued their advisory opinion clarifying states uh, state obligations to pr uh, protect and preserve the marine environment so we 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 got we published our document uh, pursuing the key takeaways we gathered from that icj opinion uh, moving on to the next slide um mathew next slide thank you so here are some of our other activities that we can, uh, we have uh, conducted as wycg so we recently conducted a successful capacity building workshop um 
at the Faculty of Law, University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. And also uh, our WICJ Youth Climate Justice Handbook. This WICJ Handbook is trident of legal documents developed by WICJ, uh, um, PISFCZ, and also a group of international lawyers. Uh, this handbook explains how law can be utilized as a tool to galvanize climate change through intergenerational equity and also intersectionality. And moving ahead with the next point, the point number five, you can see the witness stand project. So this is uh, an ongoing project um, which is conducted by PISFCC in collaboration or in partnership with uh, WYCJ. This project is an uh, advocacy and storytelling project. So mainly we are gathering stories from people who have been adversely affected by climate change and we are sharing those stories across our social media. And our main aim to uh, bring the ICJ judges attention to those stories before the uh, court proceedings begin. And also regarding the sixth point, WICJ Asian Front organized side event in ECOSOC Youth Forum. So this event highlighted the role of um, youth activism in climate vulnerable countries, focusing on WICJ's campaign uh, promoting uh, climate justice. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Here, I would like to share some of my personal reflections or my personal experiences um, as, a part, as being a part of WYCG. Um, my journey with WYCG has been a rewarding journey so far. As a law student, I had heard a lot about uh, climate change and its adverse effects. But joining WICJ helped me a lot to delve deeper into the different facets of the issue of climate change and uh, these facets that I had never been exposed before. Also, working with uh, like-minded individuals who are coming from various backgrounds helped me to hone my research skills, advocacy skills, and leadership skills. And also, I'm looking forward to contribute to the efforts toward climate justice. And also, as a person who is coming from an island nation, so I'm from Sri Lanka, um, I've seen how climate change, how Sri Lanka has been affected, adversely affected by climate change. To share an example, I have, um, I have, I have added a few pictures uh, here for your reference. So this is a uh, coastal erosion. So coastal erosion is one of the major issues faced by Sri Lanka as an island nation, which is an adverse effect um, of climate change. So I wanted to share it with you to show as an island nation, how we have been adversely affected by climate change. And also personally, I think climate change is not just about rising temperature or sea levels. It's also about people. Millions and billions of people around the world are being affected by climate change, are being displaced by the adverse effects of climate change. So this shows that this climate change has to a certain extent created inequality among different communities. So it is important that we address these inequalities and ensure vulnerable communities are protected against the climate change. Moving on to the next slide. Nothing, next slide. Here, yeah, I have, um, I wanted to share some insights as to what we are looking forward to as a youth led organization. So, um, first of all, so initially I mentioned that our witness stand project, so uh, this project is in progress. So we are gathering stories from different individuals and also we are sharing these stories across our social media. So, so far uh, we have shared a few stories. If you um, can go to our social media accounts, you can see that we have uh, posted um, these stories on our social media accounts. And also I would like to shed some light on youth-led climate litigation, the importance of youth-led climate litigation. So youth led climate litigation will be key to shape international environmental law. 
through petitions, lawsuits, global advocacy, time to time, these youth groups have shown that they are not afraid to challenge their government and relevant institutions, relevant and responsible institutions to take actions against climate change and also to take actions to mitigate the adverse, uh, adverse effects of the climate change. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Before concluding my presentation, I would like to emphasize on the urgency of youth-led climate justice. And I want to emphasize that the fight for climate justice cannot be delayed. So as you can see that, uh, see on the screen, if not us, then who? If not now, then we? So as you, it is our responsibility to utilize our voice, our platform, and our influence to make a difference in this world. In this context, we should utilize our voice, our platform, and our concerns, and also our influence to achieve sustainable development and also address the adverse effects of climate change. And I would like to, finally, I would like to invite you all to join with us in our endeavors in holding governments and institutions accountable, ensuring a just, sustainable uh, future for all of us, not only for us, but also for the generations to come. Uh, moving on to my last slide. Uh, Thank you so much, everyone. And also, I would like to uh, invite you all to join uh, join with us through our social media. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And also, um, you can see our website here. You can check our website for updates. And also, even though I haven't mentioned our YouTube channel here, you, we have a YouTube channel. You can go and check our YouTube channel. So thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much, Tithmini. And I like the idea of, you know, reminding us it's about people. Um, I, I, I go to some of these sustainable finance conferences where they talk about carbon offsets and biodiversity credits, but it's all for them about money, um, when in reality it is about, it is about people and, and, and the people, you know, who are, who are, who are really suffering. Um, and I just want to, again, you know, as I, as I often say, you know, youth are not the future. Youth are the present. This is these are the decisions that affect you from now on. You know, we've made my generation has made some pretty awful decisions. Um, you are not, you know, talking just about your future. You're talking about your present, and your and and that's why the youth voice is is so powerful. So thank you very much indeed. Um, so we'll now we'll now move along, uh, Alvin, uh, to a bit more of a discussion um, about. Um, the uh, the advisory opinion and some of the issues um, surrounding there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. I uh, just want to start off by thanking the organizers uh, for inviting me to speak at this uh, very interesting uh, and important session on the advisory proceedings on climate change uh, before the International Court of Justice. Uh, for my session, uh, I would like to focus on the procedural and strategic aspects uh, of these proceedings. Uh, before I start, I just want to uh, let you know that uh, although I'm acting as counsel for one of the parties, uh, I'm here speaking in my personal capacity. Uh, and also, uh, because the written uh, submissions in that case are not public yet, uh, I will not be discussing any confidential information that's been submitted in that case. I will only be talking about uh, what is publicly available, right? So with those uh, disclaimers out of the way, uh, I'll be talking about three points today. Uh, number one, what will be considered a good result uh, for climate activists? Uh, number two, the phenomenon of mass participation uh, before the International Court of Justice. And number three, uh, the strategic value of the advisory opinion. Right. So on my first point, uh, what will be considered a good result? So um, the first thing to note uh, is that um, the, the ICJ uh, tends to be quite conservative, uh, legally speaking. Uh, it, in many of its past advisory opinions, uh, it has made it quite clear 
that it, it will decide the law as it currently stands. Uh, it will not decide uh, the law as it should be. Uh, and therefore, in that way, uh, you know, the court may have to decide whether certain climate obligations currently exist as customary international law. And it may be the case that as things currently stand, uh, there may be insufficient evidence in terms of state practice uh, and opinion juris uh, for the court to conclude that certain climate obligations uh, exist as customary international law. The reason why this is significant is because if certain climate obligations are uh, obligations in customary international law, then they will bind all states, regardless of what kind of treaties uh, they have signed up to, right? That's the uh, sim simple explanation to it. Um, we saw this uh, happen in the nuclear weapons advisory opinion, uh, where there in that, in that case, uh, the question was whether uh, under the law as it stood back in 1996, uh, whether there was a customary international law prohibition against the use of nuclear weapons, uh, and the court in that case uh, decided that at that time there was insufficient evidence, right, uh, that there was such an obligation under international law. So the question now uh, before the ICJ is whether certain climate obligations, uh, there is sufficient evidence that certain climate obligations have crystallized uh, into obligations under customary international law. Uh, we'll see what the court says, uh, but hopefully the court will engage with that question and look at uh, the practice of states, uh, particularly in signing on to the Paris Agreement uh, and other related treaties and come to a conclusion that certain obligations have indeed uh, become obligations in customary international law. That's one strand of good result that we can hope for. Another strand of good result uh, lies in the fact that um, I think as Chimini mentioned, uh, the climate crisis is a polycentric crisis. Uh, it's not just uh, about the Paris Agreement, although the Paris Agreement is very important. Uh, however, uh, there is a concern that the court may find that the obligations of states when it comes to climate change uh, is limited to what is contained in the Paris Agreement or the UNF Triple C. But we know that climate uh, climate obligations are not just about the climate, right? Uh, human rights obligations uh, may also include actions to combat climate change. Uh, when you tackle uh, climate change, you're also trying to tackle uh, biodiversity issues. And we see this uh, in the law of the sea um, uh, obligations as well. As it lost uh, told us, right, when you are trying to uh, control pollution into the oceans, you have to con consider the impact of greenhouse gas emissions as well. So the simple message here is uh, we will hope that the court will recognize the linkages uh, between the obligations in different areas of law and not just confine the obligations to those found uh, in, in the Paris Agreement. Uh, that's number one. And number two, the phenomenon of mass participation uh, before the ICJ. Uh, as you can imagine, this is an historic case uh, with huge interest. Uh, we have seen many, many states, uh, international and regional organizations uh, become parties to these proceedings. Uh, many of them uh, will make submissions at the oral hearings uh, scheduled in December. Um, this has created some issues uh, when it comes to the court having to deal with such a large number of parties participating in the proceedings. Uh, number one, because there are so many parties uh, in these proceedings, it means that each party may find it difficult to engage uh, with, with what everyone else has said. Right? Um, there's only limited time and space that you can interact with another party. Uh, so the parties' positions in this case may not directly engage with one another. So it makes the court's uh, task quite difficult because then it has to engage uh, in, in, in the task of trying to identify uh, exactly what the parties agree and where they disagree, right? When you have more than 80 parties uh, involved in these proceedings, it may become very difficult for the court to say, oh, here's, uh, here's one argument, here are the 40 parties that agree with it. Here are the 39 that don't agree with it. And then there's one that we're not quite sure what to do about, right? So 
things like this, it may make the court's task very difficult. Another issue to think about, and this is more substantive, is when you have such a large number of participants, uh, you will also get a huge diversity of views. So what will the court do? Uh, will the court engage with every argument that has been raised by every party? Uh, or will they simply engage with uh, certain arguments that the majority of the participants have raised, right? So this becomes a substantive issue because when parties raise uh, what I call fringe argument, arguments that do not belong in the mainstream of arguments, there is a danger, there is a risk that the court uh, may, may simply ignore it, right? Because it simply does not have the capacity to deal with every single argument uh, that has been raised in these proceedings. Um, what's also really interesting, and this is probably more of an academic uh, legal observation, is when you have so many uh, states and organizations participating in these proceedings, if they all come to a common view on what the law is, does that process in and of itself create customary international law, given that there's such a huge consensus of what the law should be, right? Again, this is quite academic, uh, but it could be quite interesting phenomenon uh, that comes out from this mass participation uh, in these advisory proceedings. Lastly, I'm going to talk about the strategic value uh, of the advisory opinion. Uh, as many of you would know, uh, the advisory opinion is advisory. Uh, it is not binding on states, but of course, uh, as a declaration of international law uh, by the International Court of Justice, the statements of international law uh, contained in the advisory opinion uh, will be authoritative uh, and be highly persuasive, right? So it is not that easy, at least from a political perspective, uh, for states and governments to simply ignore uh, what a court says, right? Even though uh, it is not binding. One thing to remember as well is that uh, what comes after the advisory opinion uh, is very important. Uh, and it's important to remember that the changes and the reactions that may come uh, following the advisory opinion uh, may not be immediate. Uh, it may take years, it may take decades, uh, but it is important to remember that the advisory opinion stands as it stands. It is, it is a decision of the ICJ and it is of huge uh, persuasive value and political uh, value, even though it is not binding. So one, one recent example of this uh, is if you look at uh, the Chagos advisory opinion that was issued in 2019, right? And then fast forward five years later, uh, just a few weeks ago, the UK announced that it will return Chagos uh, to Mauritius, right? So this is one example of how uh, the advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice, even though it is not binding, uh, may produce uh, a good outcome eventually, right? I, and I say that this is very important because uh, in the immediate aftermath of the advisory opinion, uh, you, you may see people starting to uh, write about the fact that the advisory opinion is not binding or that governments may choose to ignore what the court has said, right? But here, uh, I want to uh, echo what uh, Chimini said uh, in her slide where she uh, referred to herself as one of the stubborn optimists, right? And I think this is a very important value, especially when it comes to uh, climate, climate change and activism, uh, because I believe that in this area, uh, extreme pessimism is very dangerous, right? If you feel like none of this matters at all, if you think what goes on before the ICJ is a pointless exercise, uh, you will just give up and you may feel like there's no point trying, right? So what I want to do is to encourage all of you, right, to, to have patience uh, and to keep things in perspective, but also to manage your expectations. This advisory opinion uh, from the International Court of Justice Yes, it's not binding and it's probably not going to solve the problem immediately, right? But give it time. And I do believe that it will bring us closer uh, to the solution than we doubt it, right? Uh, that's all I want to say uh, about uh, the strategic and procedural aspects of the advisory opinion. Uh, back to you, Matthew. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Alvin. Um, that was great. I mean, really exciting. And, and I think the the 
the other exciting thing is is just this idea of of managing our expectations. Um, <clears throat> and as Chismini said, and we'll probably explore later, you know, this is a it's a campaign. Um, coming to the court is a is is a historic moment. You know, really important. And it will be part of that campaign. You know, it'll be it'll feed into into hopefully you know more actions and and as Chitmini also mentioned, you know, domestic litigation um, and often probably going to be youth led uh, litigation. <clears throat> you know, I know in my country Australia, um, we don't often include international law uh, in our decisions and and in, indeed recently uh, a number of our cases on climate change made no reference to sort of international environmental law norms or even uh, treaties such as the rights of the child. So, <clears throat> you know, really interesting things that we can explore. Um, so thank you again, and uh, looking forward to some really interesting uh, questions. Um, so our next speaker, um, really from the Indonesian Centre for Environmental Law, um, she's going to look a little bit more about uh, uh, climate uh, justice. Um, and over to you, Prilly. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Matthew, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen really quick. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, and if you could, yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Prilly. I'm from Indonesian Center for Environmental Law. And if I may introduce ISEL in a little bit, a little bit. Uh, ISEL is an NGO that focuses on the development of environmental law, especially in Indonesia. But a lot of time we also work in the regional and also international level. Um, and sorry, today, sorry, it's Matthew. Could, would you be able to speak into your microphone? People oh, are yeah, okay. saying it's- Was it far? Okay, sorry. Is it clear Perfect. now? Yes, much oh, better, so. thank you. Okay. Thank okay, you. guys, so yeah, I'm going to repeat my introduction. My name is Prilly, and I'm from Indonesian Center for Environmental Law. And if I may uh, intro intro introduce ISEL a, a little bit, um, ISEL is an NGO that focuses in the development of environmental law, especially in Indonesia, but uh, a lot of time we also work in international and also regional level. And today I'm going to be talking more about um, climate justice and how to realize climate justice as a universal and also distributed and inclusive rights to a safe and stable climate. Um, so some of the things that I'm going to be talking about uh, are climate justice as a concept and then lesson learned from existing international instruments and then also some of the ways forward. So I think I want to refer to what Alfin said before that when we're trying to talk about how to tackle, how to adapt and mitigate the issue on climate crisis, we're not only talking about the issue on climate, but we also talk about a, a lot of different varieties of things. And I think that climate crisis also happens because there is an accumulated um, environmental degradation and also pollutions that has been happening. And that's why the narrative that has been escalating um, in international level is that we're faced with triple planetary crisis, the issue of climate change, the issue in pollution and waste, and also the issue in biodiversity loss. So I feel like uh, the issue on climate crisis is really multidimensional. And I agree with what Alfin just said earlier, that uh, we really have to like deep dive into it on what's actually happening. So I'm going to go to, um, I'm going to discuss about what is climate justice. I think um, I think it is important for us when it comes to talking about climate justice to um, kind of analyze what is the basic concept and also maybe principles on um, the areas of climate justice itself. So if we look through different um, definitions from research centers, international organizations, they they put it in different wordings, of course, but um, if we look through it, they they all have similarities. Uh, and if I may take one example, um, this is from the preamble of Paris Agreement 2015, um, that it acknowledges the climate change um, as a common concern and of humankind. And when it take when taking action to address climate change, we also have to uh, respect, promote, and consider um, the issues on human rights, the right to health, the rights of indigenous people, local communities, migrants, children, persons with disabilities, and people in vulnerable situations. 
the right to development as well as gender equality and the empowerment of women and intergenerational uh, equity. So in this matter, I want to um, quote what Mini said before uh, in her presentation uh, that the issue on climate change is not only um, talking about how to tackle climate crisis, but it actually talks about how we address uh, the inequalities that happen to people, ensuring that vulnerable communities are then protected under this um, particular discourse. Because when we're talking about the issue of climate crisis, of course, everyone is faced by this issue. Everyone is facing it. Uh, people in urban areas, people with privileges, talking about climate crisis, we have to see um, in a deeper level where uh, there are vulnerable and marginalized groups with even without climate crisis, they already face a uh, multidimensional inequality. And with climate crisis, they, they are faced with even more um, risks and also uh, losses, damages, and all that. So that's why um, it's really important for us when, when we're talking about climate justice, um, we're really engaging, we're really involving uh, vulnerable and also marginalized groups. And uh, it's because they're, marginalized and vulnerable groups are really close to their uh, to their natural resources. For example, indigenous people are very close. They have a close relation to their lands and also ancestors. And maybe when we're talking about women, women, because we live in this patri patriarchal uh, society, uh, women are often told to do domestic uh, work. And when, when their natural resource uh, resources are damaged and polluted, they have um, multiply uh, multiply uh, layers of burden because then you know they they can't get their source of water anymore in a close distance because of the because of the water is polluted uh, or maybe for the disability communities um, they lost their living space uh, sometimes you know even the decisions that are made is ableism sometimes we maybe don't think thoroughly about uh, what are the decisions that are made is it really accommodative for them? So maybe those are some of the things that are really have to be uh, taken to consideration. So these are probably some of the keywords that I think are similar from different um, definitions that are provided by this research centers and inter international organizations that climate crisis um, affects people disproportionately. Uh, and it is because there is a systemic socio-economic, political, gender, and also intergenerational inequalities. And therefore, climate crisis is an issue that is very intersectional. And uh, I think I also want to support uh, what, uh, what Chitmini has presented before regarding youth. Um, intergenerational equity is really, um, is really one of the key concept in sustainability um, development discourses. Um, it was, uh, it was in the Rio Declaration and then it was in the UNFCCC as well. And it is really important because then, you know, uh, the present generation has the obligation to then also think about what is this earth going to be in the next 20 or 30, um, 30 years ahead. The logic would be if today the earth is already bad, it's going to be a lot worse if we're not going to take any action today in the future. It's going to be a lot worse in the future. So uh, I think it's also important when we're talking about climate justice to see it in two aspects, two elements. The first one is procedural elements and then also talk about uh, substantive elements. So substantive elements is um, the actual right uh, to enjoy the right itself. So for example, the right to live, sorry, the right to live and then freedom from discrimination um, and all that, the right to health, the right to uh, a healthy environment. And then for procedural el elements is formal steps to be taken in um, enforcing those substantive rights. So procedural elements would um, involve the rights uh, regarding access to information and then meaningful public participation and also access to justice. And both of these elements have to be fulfilled in order for us to uh, be able to comprehensively achieve the um, right to climate justice or the, or the right to a safe and safe, stable climate. And there are other pillars as well. Uh, the first one is recognition, recognition justice. Uh, it means that we have to focus on how um, affected individuals and groups uh, should be recognized by acknowledging that there are differences of impacts 
and then procedural justice, as I said before, regarding the three main axes, uh, and then distributive justice uh, to acknowledge that risks and also opportunities must be distributed fairly and taking into account gender, race, and class disparities. And last but not least is corrective justice, which is the efforts to recover and also repair the impacts of the climate crisis on individuals and also society. And uh, I think I also remember that she, we mentioned several times about intersectionality. And I think it's a really um, important aspect when we're talking about the issue on climate justice, because before this, I talked about how there are certain categories that fall under um, vulnerable groups and also marginalized groups and also indigenous people. But what if uh, those aspects are then, you know, intersecting one to another? So, for example, when we're talking about women, there are women who live in urban areas, but there are also women who are probably a part of the disability communities and also a part of um, the indigenous communities. Therefore, there are multi layers of burden that they're going to face because that because there are several um, vulnerabilities that they own as the person. And that is um, also important for us to then look over when we're talking about advocating for, um, for climate action or climate policies, because then uh, we're going to have to uh, be able to identify what are their rights and also what are the gaps that we have to fill in. Um, and then this is, I'm just gonna, so these are some of the example, of course, there are more example of the essential environmental principles, but I think it's important to then see what are the success story uh, in our previous international instruments and then bring it on in our, you know, future advocacy and also present uh, advocacy. So for example, in the UNFCCC, there is the uh, principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. And it's really important because then it acknowledges the historical contributions of developed countries to climate change and then you know promoting equity and justice for developing nations. So it's 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 gonna be interesting to then how to address the issue on the dynamic between the global south countries and also global north. And uh, there are also princi other principles as well, such as the inclusion and participation and the rights of indigenous people, such as uh, uh, like uh, what it meant, what it mentioned in the Paris Agreement, because it's really important to then recognize this traditional knowledge and also rights in climate action. And uh, some of the other um, some of the other examples would be in the uh, UN Climate Change Conference. Um, there was the there was the discourse on global stock take how you know right, there's going to be a regular assessment of progress toward climate goals of each country therefore um it aims to promote accountability and enable equitable adjustments in climate change action so um there are several of course more uh, environmental principles that we can use in our future uh, advocacy but i think as a way forward I could say there are several things that we can also push and also keep advocating for. The first one is uh, promoting the development also and also precedent of uh, climate litigation. I think it's really it really plays a huge role in um, you know acknowledging one's rights to a safe and stable uh, stable uh, climate and also the right to a healthy environment because. Um, you know, when, when it comes to law enforcers, then acknowledging your rights um, to a healthy environment and safe and stable climate in a legal form, it really is a state, a political statement. Um, it serves as a political statement that the state is giving to you. So it's it's a really uh, powerful tool to uh, enforce your rights. Um, and second of all, um, obligating countries to develop a robust and also inclusive Climate Act. I think it's really important. I know that there are uh, there are several countries who already uh, have Climate Act, but I think it's really important if every country then obligated to have a robust and inclusive uh, inclusive Climate Act, and also mainstreaming uh, the Jet C sensitive framework within the Climate Act. And then, last but not least, um, we all, we also need to keep you know, creating an effective and also intersectional policies on climate adaptation, mitigation, and resilience, 
And of course, um, especially for marginalized and also vulnerable and indigenous people so that no one is left behind. Um, and of course, because they are the ones who are the most prone to risks uh, because of the climate crisis. So I think that's all of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prilly. So we might uh, bring everyone uh, on board. Did Mini, are you are you there? Um, you want to turn on the video because we can go into those questions. And and really, thank you so much for that uh, really amazing present. I mean, I I think for us, you know, this idea of climate justice, and then as lawyers, the idea of litigation, which is um, not always uh, not always about justice. Um, you know, and and I think Alvin, you you also mentioned, you know, judges have to choose. Uh, or select the arguments that are put before them, um, and in a in a case where there's quite a lot of um, positions being or submissions being made and parties, that sometimes it can be difficult, especially with um, you know the bench of the ICJ. And I, I I mean the whole court will be able to look. How many judges do we have on the ICJ at the moment? Um, they fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah. So they all will you know, um, have to sort of have discussions and, and come together and, 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 and develop opinions. Um, I'm just, Chikmini, are you, are you able to, are you there at the moment? Oh, great. Okay. Um, so look, we've got some amazing questions. Um, and can I ask people if, if this, um, they have more questions, if they can put them in the Q and A, um, box, but I, I guess I, I wanted to ask the three of you just you know, in that broad sense, um, uh, this was, in fact, you know, a, a global movement, um, and and really, you know, the World Youth for Climate Justice movement developed to put this idea um, before the UN. I guess um, I'm interested, Titmini, in in how powerful or how important was it that um, World Youth for Climate Justice worked with um, governments and and lawyers to sort of craft some of the the craft the questions and and craft the idea of bringing something uh, to the UN and and to the International Commission of Jurists. And I ask that because you know when I was at university, um, I with my friends we set up the Sydney University Environmental Law Society. This was back in 1988, but we never thought about bringing litigation before the International Court. <laughs> of justice. So uh, I see this as being something that is just so, you know, so powerful itself that, that this is still, although taken on by, by member states, it still is actually, you know, led by and, and, and worked with, um, you know, young people, um, experienced lawyers and, and countries. I mean, how powerful was it or how important was it to bring all those people together? Um, yes, thank you so much for that question. Hope I'm audible. So first of all, achieving climate justice is, it should be a collaborative effort. So all youth people and governments and everybody should work in collaboration in order to achieve climate justice. So that is uh, something we always believe in as a youth-led organization. Not only youth should contribute to this journey. This is a journey. This is not uh, this, this is not something happening overnight. This is journey we have been working for a very long time towards our objective, towards our goal as an organization. And also um, we do collaborations with different organizations, uh, different governmental organizations, government uh, governmental institutions to take their um, take their ideas or their perspectives into our account and incorporate their ideas, their um, their perspectives into our work. So I, we all always believe it is important to um, important to 
and address all the issues because there is always two sides to every problem, right? So in climate justice or in this climate change issue as well. So as youth, we have a different perspectives and as governments, as governmental organizations, they may have different perspectives. So it is really important to take these perspectives into account and bring all these perspectives and ideas into a table. So that is why we always believe in, that is why we do collaborations with uh, different people to make sure everyone's voice is heard and everyone is seen in our journey towards uh, achieving climate justice. I hope that answers your question. Let's see. Thank you. And, and so Alvin, just turning to you, um, and you know, you mentioned the International Law of the Sea uh, advisory opinion, which was brought by, by states for, for that advisory opinion. It was obviously, focused within the legal context there, um, but also your previous work, um, you know, your previous appearances in the ICJ, which were very much, you know, certain party disputes, I guess. Um, uh, you know, I, I look on the ECJ, ICJ rather fondly because of its uh, advisory opinion on nuclear, on, on some of the issues of air pollution, um, and also the EIA cases, uh, transboundary EIA in, in Nicaragua, um, and Costa Rica. And so those those issues, um, you know, for me, show how powerful these decisions can be, even if not replicated. D did Does this sort of um, advisory opinion or this process have a different complexion because it sort of um, was brought by a, um, you know, a, 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 a youth movement um, and now has attracted, you know, a lot of um parties, um, you know, perhaps more than is usual before uh, the ICJ and advisory opinion. I mean, does that change the complexion uh, of of what we're what we could expect out of the out of the court? Mm. Uh, thank you, Matthew. I, I think the, the 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 phenomenon of mass participation, I think we've never seen uh, proceedings where there are so many parties before uh, is definitely uh, created some problems uh, for the court. I, I mean, I actually don't know how the court is actually going to have the time and capacity to go through all the written submissions, all the written commands, and all the positions uh, by all the parties. Uh, and personally, I'm skeptical. I don't think the court will actually go through everything. Uh, they're going to lean quite heavily on their assistance. They're going to lean quite heavily on what they already know about international law uh, and sort of coming to it. Uh, from almost already having an answer in their mind and just finding for uh, the arguments that they think make sense to them. Uh, because I, I don't think it's just humanly possible to, to go through all the materials uh, that's in this case. Um, so I think that that's quite unique about this. I think the second point that's quite unique about this is the, the diversity of views uh, that, that, that can be found. Uh, in this case, uh, again, I'm not, not, I'm not going to talk about specifically what parties have said, but if you look at the questions uh, that have been presented by the UN General Assembly to the court, they are broad, they are open-ended, uh, and therefore uh, they have permitted a wide range of responses. So again, this comes back to the question of what will the court do, right? Will it take a narrow approach to the question? and go, okay, this is how we understood the questions, uh, therefore the scope is this narrow, everything else becomes irrelevant, or is the court going to say, oh, well, there are almost 10 different ways to interpret the questions, we're going to, uh, you know, accept 10 different interpretations, let's consider everything under the sun. Again, I, I'm quite skeptical, uh, because I think the judges have such a high caseload, I think the court has never been busier, uh, and they're also facing budgetary problems. <laughs> so, I, I think my, I'm quite skeptical and think that the court is just going to focus on the key points uh, and probably nothing more. Yeah. So, so I guess you know, following on from that to to, to sort of everyone, does does that mean, you know, is that good because the court could then look at established international environmental law principles such as polluter pays, intergenerational equity, precautionary principle, um, or is that bad in that they will say, well, they're not customary international law at this stage, we won't have to look at them. But this also brings in that question, which uh, Liesl Muller has, has raised, um, which is about, um, you know, international children's rights. You know, there is the Convention on the Rights of the Children. We have the General Comment 26 on uh, children's rights and the environment. 
Um, these are international obligations that directly, you know, relate to climate change issues. Um, you know, so anyone, do you think these are issues that the court would would be excited to take on board because they're relatively well established? Or am I projecting my environmental, my 35 years of environmental law uh, onto a court that really to date has not done a lot of environmental law cases? Um, so Alvin, do you want to go first and then Jimmy and, and Pri? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm happy to go first. Um, I think that when it comes to question one, the court will have no choice but to answer uh, those questions. Uh, you know, th that's what the question is asking. Uh, the court, I think, will definitely engage with the principles of international environmental law as they are relevant uh, to, to the obligations of states uh, when it comes to climate change. For question two, I think this was a question asked in the Q&A as well. Um, there are many ways the court can go with that. Um, one possibility is that the court will simply say, well, uh, this this area of law is already governed by the law of state responsibility. We don't have to say anything more. The laws are very clear. Um, if you if you breach international law, uh, the consequences are that set out in the ILC articles on state responsibility. We don't have to say anything more. So that could be a particularly um, unfortunate result because it doesn't clarify the law any further. Uh, what might be a good result is for the court to say further, say something more. Uh, and maybe grapple with some of the more difficult issues like causation, uh, issues like con uh, you know what what happens when uh, a state is is also responsible uh, for the injuries that it's claiming for. So difficult issues like this. Again, um, I have to say I'm quite skeptical. <laughs> I don't think the court will tread into those muddy waters. Uh, but I hope that the court will take the step to clarify. Uh, these tricky parts of the law. Yeah. So, Tithmini, what do you think? You know, do you think the court, oh, you may have lost to this. Oh, no, back, back again. Yeah. You're still on mute. Uh, but then could you see, repeat as, the question? Right. Yeah. Go on, please. Uh, could you please repeat the question? I didn't hear the last uh, part. Yeah. At, you know, uh, how you think, you know, whether you think, you know, ch were children's rights, you know, a big part of the argument under the rights to the child um, within the sort of the campaign to, to, to get the advisory opinion um, on the, on the, um, uh, the radar? Yeah, and I also noticed some questions uh, regarding the same subject uh, in this uh, question and answers box as well. So uh, a few people had asked me whether we have incorporated anything uh, related to uh, child rights in our arguments or in our campaign. So uh, as I mentioned previously, our objective, uh, I can speak from our, my organization. So um, as I mentioned previously, WICJ or World Youth for Climate Justice, um, our main objective is to securing an advisory opinion from International Court of Justice. So uh, most importantly, we are fighting for the rights of children who live in the, these affected areas uh, by the climate change. So that plays a vital role in our campaign. So, and also we, uh, as I mentioned previously, we are focusing on protecting the rights of individuals, not only the individuals um, who belong to the present generation, also the generations to come. So this, I think uh, this is intergenerational equity as um, I think Kartika mentioned, in, uh, she discussed that in detail. So intergenerational e equity is, and also uh, in intergenerational equity is something that we are advocating for. Um, I think uh, that uh, answers your question. Thank you. And, and really, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, at some of these uh, core principles, there's a there's a really interesting question uh, in the chat um, uh, from Widya. Um, the multidimensional inequality, how do you think it can be solved and how young people see the role uh, differential treatment principle in climate change? And there's a, a reference to the common but differentiated responsibility 
and and achieving climate justice. And, and I guess you know within that context that we are now seeing uh, some of the current emissions of of greenhouse gases in countries like Indonesia and China and India uh, mirror or exceed some of the you know uh, historical emissions as well. So. So I think for the first question regarding multidimensional inequality, I think it's, it's a pretty, the microphone sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> I keep forgetting. Yeah. For the first question regarding multidimensional inequality, I think I think it's an issue that needs um more than just um knowledge and understanding, but it also needs some sort of activism. I mean, um not everyone would ha not everyone would have the guts to go all the way there to you know actually advocate for people who are a part of like vulnerable groups or marginalized unless they have the heart for it so i think that's that's what like um that's a very challenging issue um of course um but i think what what we can do uh especially as a young people um we can keep you know just mainstreaming the narratives about um, you know, there is injustice happening and also there is inequality that happens um, and how this issue of environmental crisis is really affecting them, affecting their livelihood. And hopefully, you know, um, day by day, maybe there is someone who who will, you know, it will touch their hearts because I think I really believe that it's the issue of activism, you know. Um, people can be smart about this issue. People can know about this, uh, but if they don't have their heart for it, then it's 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 gonna be hard and then for the the second question would be the how young people see the role differential principle oh, okay yeah, and yeah common mm -hmm. in achieving justice yeah i think it's really it's a really um interesting issue to uh be talked about especially uh in a young generation you know the dynamic about how um, you know, the developed countries, um, you know, actually have contributed a lot of um, environmental damages and pollution to developing countries. Um, and I think it really takes um, a lot of, you know, a lot of digging by young people to, to want to know more about what's happening and why is everything seems like burden is on us in developing countries. So I think, um, it's it would be interesting to learn more about the historical um record of uh the industries for for example and then you know just kind of to trace down uh trace back about what happened in the past and how it contributed to the uh to the recent condition now nowadays um so can i can i just follow up on this common but differentiated responsibility i mean alvin do you do you We've got a couple of questions about mm -hmm. whether or not something that we think the ICJ would look at, um, both in terms of uh, obligations of states uh, and potentially in terms of the liability of states. Um, and I know that common and differentiated responsibility has been around since 1992 in the Framework Convention on Climate Change. I think it is, it is mentioned um, there. So, I mean, is this likely to be something um, that is going to be addressed or do you, th I mean, again, speculatively, mm -hmm. not as. Yeah, it's, it's speculative, uh, but you know, that's, that's where the fun is uh, in speculating. I, I think there's a good chance uh, that a court will engage with the principle of uh, common but differentiated responsibilities uh, in first, in the first question. Um. I you know I think the question there is a possibility that the court may evade it altogether. It's not it's not out of the realm of possibility, uh, but because it features uh, this principle features quite strongly, uh, I think in the UNF Triple C and also the Paris Agreement, it will be quite difficult for the court not to talk about it at all. It will be quite unusual uh, for the court not to even mention it. Um, as to whether the court may discuss it in the context of consequences uh, for question two, I think that is the more interesting question. Uh, what happens uh, when, when such responsibilities are not met? Uh, again, there, for question two, I am a bit more skeptical that the court will discuss that concept in the context of question two, but I think for question one, it is quite likely that the court will discuss it. Hmm. Um 
Chithini, I'm not sure. I know you were having some challenges. If if you're online, please let us know. Um, and because I'd like to get also sort of things about the future. I do have one quick question, maybe that you could help us with, Alvin. There are mm. questions. Um, uh, one from Isla Muller from South Africa on what the court's position is on child participation, um, and and indeed the the procedures for for the oral hearings. Mm. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Um, I'm not quite sure what is meant by child participation, uh, but I'm 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 guessing it's about appearing at the oral hearings. So. Number one, the oral hearings are public, so anyone is free to attend them. But uh, if you want to speak at the hearings, you have to be invited by the court to do so. And only uh, those parties who have submitted written submissions and written comments and invited by the court to speak at the court uh, can do so. Yeah. Um, so those parties, are they their states, but are they also um, NGOs or... It could be NGOs or communities, but they have to be invited by the... They have to be invited. Yeah, that's right. So there are, I think someone also mentioned NGOs. I think there are some NGOs on the list. Uh, they have made written submissions and comments to the court uh, and they are parties to the proceedings and therefore uh, they are allowed uh, to make submissions at the oral hearing. But you need you need the court's permission to do that. Yeah. So I think that, that also is Kaliako Topiko's question about um, will the court be able to listen to the voices of the communities and the youth? Uh, and that would be presumably if the court um, wants to. If they don't want to, they they don't have to, unless unless a state party is is That's right. advanced. That's um, right. Yeah. I, I wonder, Chitmini, do you, is there anyone um, that you know? Um, will will youth for climate justice be able to be um, make any presentation, or have you? Do you know that, or will we rely on someone else to take up the submissions from? Um, nothing from here. I'm not sure whether I'm visible and audible. I have turned on my camera. Yeah. I hope you can see me. Yes, we can. Yeah, so I was just wondering whether. Um, World Youth for Climate Justice, if you knew if they had been um, uh, invited to make any submission or if there was any state party that was going to um, make submissions on, on your behalf. Uh, I think Dulki can answer it. Uh, Dulki, are you here? Yes. Hi, Dulki. Um, Dulki? Yeah. Thank you so much uh, hi. Uh, yeah uh, so unfortunately we do not have the opportunity to uh, we are trying to communicate with our national governments how uh, uh, whether we can uh, participate as part of the dedication or not but I'm not really sure how successful that would be. So the option that we have taken is to have this other uh, this initiative that we call as the witness stand, as uh, the ICJ, and requesting them to consider what we climate change and to us as a clear opinion on the climate. So that is how we are approaching uh, the court. Thank you. And, and really, um, what, I mean, one of the, the, the interesting questions for me is also, you know, what happens after um, the advisory opinion? It, it might take a while, I guess, Alvin, for the court to come up with a, uh, a judgment or a, an opinion. Um, yep. Could that be six months or a year or? Uh, I, I think we're looking at, earliest uh 2026 yeah right so yeah so that's a long time so really what do we do in the meantime <laughs> are we going to um you mentioned sort of litigation um based on some of the um uh, perhaps some of the arguments raised um and and I, also i think for dulki and chithmini uh, you also mentioned the idea of more litigation from 
uh, young younger people or, or youth. Um, you know, what what do we think is going to happen in in twenty twenty five on on some climate litigation? Uh, shall I take that question, Chitmini? Yeah, sure, do okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So when we started uh, our movement back in 2021, um, our fight, our first challenge was to getting um, the UNGA to listen to us, right? When we had initial deadlines, but we never really got to um, stick. We could not stick to those deadlines, but still we did not give up. I mean, honestly and personally, I did not think that all of this would happen so quickly. So I am so, so happy that right now we have completed the written submissions, we have completed the written comments phase, and we are steadily proceeding towards the oral hearings. And if it's uh, only a matter about one, year, one more year of waiting, then I am happy to wait. <laughs> Given that we have started this in uh, back in 2021, but um, after the oral uh, hearings, and I'm sure we will still continue to promote awareness on what is happening and how we can uh, make sure that youth voices are heard. Um, so WICJ's journey is going to get more important after the oral hearings. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of plans actually Actually, and uh, we will ensure that we keep on this uh, campaign and we keep on this movement uh, going on towards 2026, if, if that's when we get the um, uh, judgment from the court. Thank you. Thanks, Silky. And Prilly, what, what do you think? I mean... Yeah, I think in the meantime, what we can do is also... Um advocating for the na the narratives in national so when if we want to push for narrative on climate litigation um as for it in, in indonesia we we try to look for um chances and opportunities where we can kind of like dig into our constitution and also other um derivative uh regulations as well where it can be um you know, referred in one of the arguments when we're trying to go into litigation that can kind of uh, involve the narrative on climate rights. So I think we can keep narrating on that in the meantime uh, while we're waiting for the decision. And, and I guess in your, you know, your the polycentric approach uh, and the, the multiple issues that you identified you know, in climate justice, that also could include some of the litigation on on clean air, cleaner air that that has already happened in in Indonesia. Um, yeah. So, is that also something? You know, maybe even more litigation on the rights of the child. Is it for me or? Oh well, yeah, pretty. I was gonna yeah, just to um, you, and then then I was gonna ask Alvin and and just many about yeah. you know idea of future litigation, uh, looking at maybe through the child rights lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important to, you know, to go into litigation where the representative would be, for example, women, and then probably youth. So we can kind of, um, you know, encourage more of uh, vulnerable communities to then be involved in, um, in uh, climate litigation. I think it would be really, um, it would be, it would, serve as a landmark cases as well, uh, as a precedent of uh, how then, you know, different parts of the groups in societies and communities can then take part in achieving their rights to a safe and stable climate. So I think that would really make a statement. Mm. So Chitmini, do you think, yeah, um, um, one, one other question that came in the, in the Q&A is, um, by uh, saying that often grassroots or youth movement activism, lack of legal awareness or knowledge uh, has lack of legal awareness. How, what would your recommendations be for mainstreaming and strengthening law perspectives for them so that the common, the people see that the law um, is at least reflecting their views and not just uh, an exclusive um, area for certain people? Uh, yeah. 
Satyu, um, we as an organization, we have identified this gap. So that is why we have come up with different workshops and different sessions uh, to educate people and impart our knowledge. So we are working on a series of uh, master classes uh, with Utopia. So you might have heard um, of Utopia. There is another uh, organization. Uh, we are working on them um, uh, on a series of uh, master classes. And also we are preparing uh, lectures in more simple way to explain these things to you because these things to people because one thing we identified is most of these people know what climate change is but they don't know the legal intricacies of it because this climate change issue has different facets to it it is not just one thing so uh, so it is our responsibility to educate them and show them the different facets and uh, um and also explaining the law because this law part is the hardest part to understand a lot of people because they don't know there are certain international laws pertaining to it or domestic laws pertaining to it. They are not aware of it. So as youth organization, we see that as our responsibility and we are working on it. And also we are planning on organizing a summer school as well next year. Um, and uh, like that, that is how we would like to contribute to the global discourse. And also as youth organization, we actively participate in uh, regional and global conferences to share our ideas, share our thoughts, share our knowledge, and also to expand our connections. And we are contributing the we are contributing to the collaborative efforts uh, taken by other international youth organizations and um, other international organizations in general. So that, that is uh, our approach to educating people and approaching to the grassroots levels and make sure they know these laws and uh, that helps them to influence and utilize their voices and the influence to promote climate justice and also make sure their voices are heard and they are seen in this matter. And and I must say, Alvin, um, just to you, you know, this is the first time my LinkedIn feed has been full of things about the International Court of Justice. It's mm. not, you know, it's not the sexiest topic for, um, but it seems to become, you know, people thinking about that. Yeah. And and I'm also that, you know, this discussion about uh, amending the Rome Statute on, on ecocide, um, you know, it seems that there is at least a little bit more focus on uh, the role of some of these international courts. Um, yeah. Plus, of course, the advisory opinion from the International Law of the Sea Tribunal. Um, we had the Inter-American Court of, uh, of Human Rights come out with a number of very powerful judgments on uh, environmental uh, rule of law issues um, and and environmental rights. So, I mean, is this a, a you know, is this a a way that we're starting to think about how these bodies impact yep. on our on our daily lives? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's so important uh, that we educate uh, the population about international law. And that is such a challenge, uh, because it's, it can be quite difficult at times. Uh, I think one of the, the key problems, uh, especially when I, when I teach, uh, students international dispute settlement is them relating their own experiences with domestic courts and try to apply that to international courts. Uh, you know, sometimes you hear people say, oh, why can't you just, why can't Australia just, uh, you know, take China to court, right? That ICJ is, you know, because there's no basis of jurisdiction. Uh, it's very difficult for, for, for non-international lawyers to understand that uh, you need a state's consent to take them to the International Court of Justice. And that can be frustrating. Uh, and that can be unfamiliar because growing up in a domestic judicial system, uh, when a wrong has been done, you think, okay, I'll just go to the court, right? So there's a lot of uh, misaligned expectations uh, about international law and particularly international courts and tribunals. Uh, it's very important to know what the courts can do, but also what they cannot do. Because um, when you assume that the problem is taken care of through uh, litigation before international courts, you think that there is uh, the problem has, has will be solved that way, right? But 
the problem may not be solved at all. It may be ignored because you think the problem is being processed through the courts and tribunals, right? So it, it, it may be a blind spot. Uh, so it's very important, uh, I think, to educate the general population about what this, what International Court of Justice can do and what it cannot do. I also want to go back to, to the previous point that was mentioned, I think is quite important, uh, which is what to do in 2025. Uh, while we're waiting for the advisory opinion, actually a lot can be done. Uh, one thing to remember is that uh, at the opening of the uh, oral arguments in December, uh, the court may decide, and I think the court will decide, to make the written statements and the comments public. So this gives everyone the opportunity to look at what their governments have said about this important issue. Uh, and also, uh, it's very important to follow closely uh, what the government representatives will say during the oral hearings, right? Because uh, if they have made certain commitments, uh, if they have taken certain positions uh, before the International Court of Justice, uh, you can assume that that is their position under international law uh, and they should comply with it. So where they act inconsistently with those commitments, that's where the activism comes in. That's, that's where people need to call out uh, the inconsistent actions and uh, take, hold them to account. So yes, a lot, a lot has to be done. A lot should be done in 2025, even while we wait for the result. Mm, no, that's exciting. Um, so look, we've got uh, we've got a few more questions. Sorry if I can just go through it. So uh, from Crystal Whippy, um, aloha, Crystal and and Bula to our friends uh, in in the Pacific. Um, in the questions before the ICJ, there has been an outline of various international law. Um, uh, she was curious that there doesn't seem to be an express inclusion of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, can you make any observation on that or, or comment? Did, did you see, um, do you think um, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People is something that um, is likely to come up in the in the advisory opinion, or again, is this perhaps an issue that they might set set to the side? Is this for me? For Alvin, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, I missed that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why uh, certain uh, legal instruments were left out in the uh, request for advisory opinion. Uh, this is completely speculative. Uh, but you know, it's it, you have to remember that this is a political process, uh, from the drafting of the request for advisory opinion to getting it passed at the general assembly. There is a political process, and there is a political consideration of whether certain instruments are likely to attract uh, more objection than others. So there may be some sort of consideration there, but you know, I wasn't involved in that process, so this is purely speculative. Uh, so that could be one explanation. Um, as to, however, uh, even though the even though DRIPS and the Convention of the on the Right of the Child and other conventions are not expressly listed uh, in the non-exhaustive list of legal instruments in the request for advisory opinion, that doesn't mean that uh, the parties and the court cannot look beyond uh, those instruments. And I think that it is quite likely that the court will have to look beyond uh, those, those instruments that were listed. It's a very short list, to be honest. So I think the court will have to look beyond uh, that list. However, uh, there is always that risk that the court will say, well, the climate obligations are contained in the Paris Agreement and nothing else. That, that, that is what I consider probably the worst case scenario. Uh, if, if that happens, then the court doesn't have to look beyond any of those, uh, doesn't have to look beyond the Paris Agreement uh, and none of these other considerations are even relevant. Quite unlikely, I would think, but you know that's definitely within the realm of possibility. Um, I mean, that that's a, you know, that that's a really powerful thought. I mean, what, and I guess, you know, really, if I could ask you, you know, what, from you know a, an Indonesian perspective or an ASEAN perspective, what what do you think would be a sort of a good outcome, um, e even any, from you know the, the any oral... indigenous indigenous community, even beyond indigenous, but also on on some of these other issues, um, you know, for example, uh, whether there are sort of clear liability issues um, 
arising out of customary international law, irrespective of, of treaty law, um, yeah. irrespective of the Framework Convention on Climate Change or the Biodiversity Convention or the interaction um, with those. I mean, what would you think would be a good um, a good outcome? Yes, for Indonesia itself, I feel like in recent years, there has been a lot of development. And I would say that even our environmental law has been pretty progressive, I would say. Um, so I'm pretty positive about uh, the future development of, um, you know, if there is going to be international, um, you know, uh, environmental uh, principles coming up. Um, but in Asian, I'm not sure because uh, I know that um, as a region, I think uh, we're kind of behind in terms of the progressive of uh, the issue on environmental rights. So I don't think, especially the issue of indigenous people, I think that, that it's going to be hard for um, Asian countries to uh, be in, you know, one one unified decision. Because again, you know, there are differences in uh, how they interpret indigenous communities and so on and so forth. And including the issue on, you know, customary in, uh, international law later if uh, there's anything coming up. Um, and, and, and so a question that um, I've also been sent, which maybe Alvin, you might be able to answer is, um, how does the ICJ opinion or how will the ICJ advisory opinion impact uh, the member states from applying their own policies? I mean, are there any precautions if a member state uh, did not adhere to an ICJ uh, opinion or, or uh, ad advisory opinion mm. on on international, or is it just an opinion um, that states can endorse or or respect or, yeah. or reject? Yeah. So, I uh, the advisory opinions are not binding, uh, which is you know quite quite confusing for 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 non lawyers, because the natural reaction is then why is the court doing this right? The idea of it not being binding is uh, when there is non-compliance, you, you can't go to the Security Council and say, hey, uh, this state has not complied with its obligations, uh, which you can do uh, under the uh, the statute of the ICJ and the UN Charter when it's a binding judgment. So that's the main difference. Even though it's non-binding, uh, the court is uh, regarded as um, an authoritative body when it comes to declarations of international law. So whatever it says in, is international law uh, will generally be regarded as international law, right? And when it comes to domestic implementation, that is, uh, that is where the difficulty is because uh, most common law countries, uh, including Australia, uh, we are dualist systems, right? So there is no automatic integration of international law. You, there is still a step that needs to be taken uh, to implement those international obligations domestically. Uh, so it, it's going to be, there is no automatic uh, implementation of the ICJ's advisory opinion, right? So there's still a step that needs to be overcome. However, uh, where states act inconsistently with their obligations under international law, uh, that's where things can be done, right? That's where you need to do to call out uh, the inconsistencies, the bad behavior, uh, and maybe where, is, where there is a basis of jurisdiction, uh, you may be able to, to commence proceedings against the state, right? But uh, this is very speculative. Um, so it really depends uh, on how each state individually reacts to the uh, advisory opinion after it's being issued. Yeah. Um, so, so look, just in the, in the sort of the closing, um, time, um, what I would like to sort of do is maybe just look at um, some of the interaction for the ideas about small island states. Um, you know, Sri Lanka um, is an island. Um, uh, Australia is a big island. Indonesia has lots of islands. Um, Singapore in particular is a very, uh, is an island state. You know, I, I'm really interested in whether you think um, that there will be some uh, focus on some of the island states, you know, will that be a, a separate to, you know, the broader issue of, of, of obligations and, and, uh, and liabilities. Um, but also we've got a couple of questions. One is about the BBNJ, the um, 
uh, uh, biodiversity beyond natural national jurisdictions and whether strategies can be employed to align the objectives of climate litigation and activism with the goals of the BBNJ agreement to achieve a more holistic approach to marine conservation. Um, but also from uh, my Nguyen that the ITLOS advisory opinion, the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea <clears throat> advisory opinion has clarified many states' obligations, particularly the nature of obligation and due diligence. However, when it comes to the obligation to technical assistance, nothing is mentioned about who owes the obligation and how to assess the state's compliance. Um, do you think the current international law state practices are sufficient for the ICA to give answers on these matters, which is really obviously interesting if there's an obligation to provide assistance uh, and technical assistance, given that climate change is, is a worldwide problem that all states have to actually, you know, have, have you know, perhaps a, a joint and several liability, I don't know. So anyone, um, Alvin, did you want to sort of comment on that that last question about um, the ITLOS advisory opinion and um, some of these obligations for technical mm. assistance that might come out? Yeah, I mean, that is a really difficult and specific question. Uh, but I, I think that the fact that it lost, uh, did not go that far to declare that an obligation under customer international law uh, may mean that it is quite unlikely uh, for the ICJ to come to a different conclusion. Uh, it will very much depend on what parties have said uh, to the court uh, and whether the court feels itself uh, capable of carrying out the analysis. Uh, it is very important to recall the context. Uh, I think in its most recent, in its 2023 judgment uh, in Nicaragua, Colombia, the court made certain uh, observations about whether ob certain obligations exist under customary international law. And the court took a rather, um, I would say, uh, short approach to identifying those obligations and the court's approach was heavily criticized. Uh, so I think the court in that context uh, will be more careful about trying to identify obligations under international law, more rigorous uh, as, as one would expect. So, you know, therefore, uh, all, all, with all that said, I think, you know, if the it loss does not feel confident enough to declare that obligation as existing under customary international law, uh, I'll be quite quite skeptical about the ICJ uh, coming to a different answer. But again, much will depend on uh, what has been submitted. Yeah. Um, and really, what do you think? I mean, are we going to, you know, enter into some of this climate justice litigation, looking at small island states or island states that clearly have, you know, some you know specific uh, and quite extreme um, challenges when it comes to 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 climate change. Mm -hmm. Is this for national context or more international, Matthew? Um, maybe, maybe international, um, or yeah. or natural, whatever you'd like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, if we're if we're starting to from national context, I think it's a lot easier because you know it's contextual, uh, of course. For example, for Indonesia itself, um, we've started to um, put our eyes on the coastal areas because we know that how they are badly impacted uh, from the climate change. But in terms for uh, in terms on uh, the international context, I think um, I'm not so sure because maybe it's not it's not um, a universal concern. Maybe of course. Sorry, I mean, of course, it's like a universal concern, but I, I mean, in terms of like um, the political wheel in international context, I'm still not sure if it's going to be um, endorsed that much compared to if, um, you know, uh, it's in national context because we are actually dealing with it. So I'm still kind of skeptical, Matthew. <laughs> so yeah, that's mm -hmm. my take. Probably. And Tipmini, in terms of, you know, um the work that you've been doing, um, you know, a lot of it's focused on engagement and and also on on islands, you know, on on island island states, you know. Um, do you think that's going to be a, a major area of focus for you in 2025? You know, trying to really highlight um, the the obligations of of other states towards island states. 
Um, I think her connection is a bit unstable, so I'll take that question, Matthew. Yes, um, mm -hmm. island nations, especially the Pacific Islands, have been have played a, a, a very important role in our movement in our campaign. So we will definitely be working with them um, in 2025, and uh, how we can, you know. Uh, get more youth involvement. So, uh, youth more youth involvement and what we can do about this state obligation. So, all of that we are planning to do in 2025. That will be one of our uh, main um, uh, uh, main items in our agenda for 2025. Yeah, that's great. So, and so also, Matthew, yeah. just add on to what Bilki mentioned. Uh, so initially, we were mentioned about our uh, witness stand project. So in this witness stand project, so far we have received a lot of videos uh, from uh, different individuals from different countries. A lot of them are from island nations, for an instance, uh, from Fiji. So they have expressed their concerned co their concerns through the videos, and they are addressing the judges and they are shedding lights on what kind of adverse effects that they are suffering from. So um, yeah, with uh, projects like this, uh, we are expecting to bring more stories to the light before the advisory, pro uh, the advisory opinion proceedings begin. Uh, so yeah. That, that's great. Um, so yeah, so as we sort of concluded this one, and I, I should say that um, uh, we had had an initial discussion about perhaps following up uh, with a webinar on, on loss and damage. Uh, and liability, and I think there's a lot of really interesting uh, questions. I mean, as as Alvin sort of said at the beginning, well, that's there are clear clear statements that a, a state is um, is obligated not to cause harm and and damage from activities, um, and that's been you know there from trail smelter arbitration or even before. You know, that's a clear um, statement of international law how it impacts uh, in particular environmental issues, I think is really, uh, really, really uh, challenging and interesting. Um, so I'd, uh, so we may think about um, developing another webinar, looking you know, a little bit more about the, the, the liability issues, um, because I think we can probably all agree that most countries have actually failed uh, to protect our planet from adverse impacts of, of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, some have done better than others, um, and some have clearly done worse or have, have failed, perhaps in their in their duty of care. Um, so, but just in sort of you know giving you some last closing ideas or thoughts, um, either on climate justice or climate litigation, uh, or on what we could expect or what you hope to expect in twenty twenty five and twenty twenty six. Um, you know, to to wrap up and make some conclusions. Um, Prilly, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can go first. I think to as my closing statement, I would say um, hopefully we can escalate the discourse of climate justice, uh, both in national context and international context. Um, and you know, hopefully, um, I believe that any platforms that we can use in international, even though it's not it's not binding, it's still a channel, it's still a platform to be used. So. Um, yeah, I think um just we just need to keep going and then uh just use any channels that we have, uh and don't give up. I think yeah, I think that that would be my closing statement. That um uh, stubborn optimist, I think is that <laughs> is that right? Yeah. The Alvin. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I I have two points in in reflection. I think number one, when we talk about um liability and damages the focus is sometimes too much on compensation but when it comes to climate change uh, you know money is not going to do anything and here i think it's really important to remember that under international law one of the key forms of reparation is restitution uh, which requires the states to put the situation back before the wrongful act and that can be a very powerful remedy in climate change right if emissions have exceeded uh, you know, allowed level, then the states need to do more than what they've been currently doing to bring them down to a level that is, uh, that would take them 
into, in, into what's permitted. So let's not forget about uh, restitution as a very powerful remedy beyond just damages and compensation. That's my first point in reflection. The second point is the problem of climate change hits at the very heart of the floor of the international law system. It is a global problem. Uh, it is an environmental problem. And the environment doesn't understand political boundaries, right? So it's it's a collective problem, and it's very easy for each state to just put a hand up and go, it's not my fault, it's someone else's fault, right? But that's where we need a bit of hope. We need a bit of optimism. Uh, sometimes when I lose hope, I just remember that we have done this before. Um, remember what we did with ozone gases? Uh, you know, the hole is healing. Uh, we've done it before, and we can do it again. It's a bigger problem, uh, but the approach is the same. Engagement, activism, diplomacy, and patience, uh, I believe it will pay off. Yeah. Great words. No, no, great, great sentiment, Sue. Um, Jitmini. Uh, yeah, I think. So um, regarding the loss and damage, I think the issue of loss and damage caused by climate change is yet to be answered in full. But uh, I believe, uh, as far as I can remember, there are some international mechanisms to address the issue of loss and damage caused by uh, or climate um, change induced for loss and damage. For an example, also international mechanism for loss and damage. Uh, I think uh, it was a significant step taken towards achieving or addressing this issue of loss and damage. And uh, there are some funds um, also regarding this, uh, if I'm not mistaken, for an instant uh, green climate fund, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, regarding my final remarks, um, I would like to emphasize, so I emphasize this quite a few times, but I would like to emphasize the fight for climate justice cannot be delayed. Uh, and as I mentioned, we are at a critical juncture of history and it is really urgent to take steps to address climate change and take mitigatory steps to uh, avoid the adverse effects of the climate change. And uh, the work of World Youth for Climate Justice or WICJ in advocating for ICJ advisory opinion is a testament to the power of youth. But it is also a reminder that this is just a beginning. This is not an end. This is just a beginning. And also, as a young person, I'm just 24 years of age. So I'm as a young person committed to climate justice. I'm every single day. I'm inspired by the resilience and dedication showed by youth all around the world, all across the world. And together, I vehemently believe. Together, through WYCG and beyond, we can uh, we will continue to hold our governments accountable, uh, our, um, our our governments accountable, and also our, we continue to post or continue to push our governments to take necessary actions, relevant actions to address climate change and ultimately achieve climate justice. Thank you, Mate. Thank you, Titmini. And again, I mean, for me, you know, we often hear this idea of we have to listen to the voices of youth. Um, one of the things I think about the advisory opinion for the ICJ and, and while we focus on the history is that this is the voice of youth taken to the highest level at the United Nations General Assembly and then to the highest uh, court, International Court of Justice. And I think that's that's something we can't um, we can't ever forget that this was something that was started uh, started you know in in Vanuatu so in a in a small island state uh, and then you know became a global movement and I think that that's a tribute to everyone involved. I do want to thank you all, um, Alvin, Prilly, uh, Titmini, Dulki, um, for being there. You know, it's been one of the privileges from the Asian Research Institute for Environmental Law, from Rocky and myself and the team. To have been, you know, partners with you and 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 done what we can to help you on the journey. Um, can I just say that in terms of the questions in the in the chat, the webinar uh, we've recorded it. We will be uploading it onto our YouTube channel. Um, if you have registered uh, your certificate and and attended the the event, you will get a certificate in the next couple of weeks. Um, and if there are any questions, you can you can email us um, through the the sort of the registration or or so that's where we will. Um, send all of the and and I thank everyone for attending again 
the idea of the stubborn optimist. Um, and as Alvin says, sometimes we can, um, you know, feel a little bit uh, concerned. You know, litigation, uh, as Prilly knows, it's not always going to be a, a pleasant outcome. Sometimes you lose but the, the litigation, but you might win um, the policy battle. Um, and I think one of the, you know, extraordinary things is, is exactly as the coalition and as many has said, you know, this is about ensuring that we do get more action and, and stronger action, uh, not only on climate justice, but perhaps on environmental justice. So again, thank you, our speakers and our presenters. Um, it's been a really, we've covered a lot of ground and I really appreciate uh, the opportunity both for the presentations uh, and the questions and answers. And I welcome everyone to join us for our next webinar, um, which will hopefully be in the next uh, couple of months. Um, so until then, thank you very much uh, and keep fighting the good fight for climate justice. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.